Well, I want to uh, say good evening and thank you all for coming. This is a splendid sized audience. My name is Bob Seabacker, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. My office is in Hawthorne. I've practiced in Westchester for my entire career, just around 30 years. I trained at uh, Georgetown Medical School, Mount Sinai Surgery, uh, Special Surgery, a Hospital for Special Surgery Orthopedics, and a year of pediatric orthopedics in Toronto. I came to Phelps in 1981, and I've worked there ever since in orthopedics, originally starting in pediatrics and general orthopedics, and gradually over time, uh, very much excited by uh, what I saw as I trained in a hospital in Manhattan where hip and knee replacements were virtually invented in this country and really the world. Uh, loved the operations of hip and knee replacement and wound up gravitating uh, more and more into that. I see a few of my patients in the office, victims of mine. Um, and uh, the, uh, the things that I learned as I did that and my group of seven other orthopedists sent cases to me for knee replacement or hip replacement, uh, the first lesson I learned was just because the guys who did arthroscopy or sports medicine, and I guess you can divide uh, orthopedic care into three groups, the pediatric orthopedists who take care of kids, the sports medicine doctors who take over when the kids are 18 or 19, and when they get finished with a patient somewhere around 50 or 55, they throw them to the junk pile, which is me. <laughs> but today, uh, we live in a time and place where everybody rightfully expects to live longer, and not just to live longer, but to enjoy that life. And uh, one of the things I say again and again is I find myself operating on people who used to be dead, which is to say uh, they keep them going. And if you're going, uh, you really want to enjoy life. And so as I gravitated into this all total joint practice about um, 15 or 16 years ago, fed by my partners, I realized that just because they were fed up with a patient that they couldn't help anymore doing telescopic surgery or whatever they did, <clears throat> and that patient was sort of finally coming to grips with the fact that maybe they weren't going to play once full court basketball, they sent them to me saying, I've done everything I can to replace their knee. I learned very early that that wasn't always the best solution. Sometimes uh, I did it, not thinking they really had enough arthritis, and sure enough, they didn't like what happened, they didn't like going through it, and when it was all said and done, I'm not sure they realized or felt that it was better than the bad knee they had before, and I began to realize that there was this gray zone, and it's still a gray zone, of people who have a knee that's bothering them, it's wearing out, but it's not a knee that they want to have replaced or often should be replaced. I'm going to talk to you tonight about a program that I've sort of uh, fallen into or developed out of necessity, the necessity of trying to help people like you, who have bad knees, who want something done, uh, but aren't necessarily ready or able or willing to have a big operation. Knee replacement has a reputation of being a difficult operation to go through. There have been a lot of advances in it that make it easier, but nonetheless, that still holds. I basically have three groups of people that all are in this program. They all really have arthritis that's pretty easily defined. You only have to take an x-ray of them standing up, and you see that the spaces between the bones are narrowed. Now before we go on, I want to just talk to you about what that means. And it's very easy because, because bone is white. And here's the end of your thigh bone. Can everybody see that? Yeah. And it rests on top of the tibia, like that. So bone is white, and, but if you take an x-ray, there's a space between those bones, and what's in there? Well, we all know that it's that, right, cartilage, the pearly white stuff, 
you see on the end of the chicken bone. Now everybody knows what that is. And it sits in there, coating the ends of these bones I've just brought in. Like that. That's what makes a space. And God, in her wisdom, <laughs> added a little shock absorbing pad that sits in there on the edge, like this. And mistakenly, that's called a cartilage. It's really not. It's a meniscus. And when you take an x-ray and there's no space anymore, it means all that stuff in there is worn out. If it's even narrowed halfway, there's not much chance that any of these delicate structures are anything like the way they were when you were young or that person was young. So taking an x-ray and seeing narrowing is a very good way to know there's significant arthritis. <clears throat> taking an MRI after that is not terribly helpful because it's going to show that all those things are worn out and roughed up and torn and ragged. Well, you already know that. There are other reasons to take MRIs in people's knees your age, my age now, <laughs> but it's not for that. So before we go on, these joints, of which the knee is a good example, the hip, the shoulder, are the most advanced kinds of joints in the human body. There are other kinds of joints besides these gliding, sliding, lubricating joints, like the joints that connect the sacroiliac plates of the pelvis, the joints that fuse the sutures of your skull, the joints in the pubis, where the two halves of the pelvis come together, the joints between the vertebrae, those are different kinds of joints. These joints, the gliding, sliding joints, have certain characteristics that we're just going to cover briefly so that you understand as we go on. They have a membrane that goes around them and I made it blue and it's a tube, like a cylinder, and it wraps around the knee. And in that membrane, a nourishing environment is produced by special cells that secrete mucus into the knee and help the knee to glide and slide. The cartilage is nourished. It's a living structure that's nourished by cells that grow and produce special materials in it and keep it alive. It has a very limited capacity to repair itself, but it has some. It often isn't damaged in people until they're 90 years old. I sometimes see people with normal x-rays and good knees at 90 years old. For most people, cartilage stays healthy, but not for everybody. The word arthritis, itis, means irritation of something, anything. Mastitis, your breast. Mastoiditis, your ear. Otitis, your eardrum. Arthritis, a joint. All different things irritate joints. We're only going to talk about one or two tonight. We're going to talk about joints that wear out from use or from abuse. And abuse goes all the way to trauma, falling, using a jackhammer. <clears throat> We're going to talk about that kind of arthritis, which most of you know is wear and tear arthritis or osteoarthritis. Not the greatest name, but it means osteo means bone. And I guess if you wear out your cartilage and all this pink and blue stuff is gone and the bone touches on bone, the new joint is bone on bone, that's osteoarthritis, I guess. But it's really, it's really not just a degradative process. It's an attempt of the human body to cope with damage over time and yet keep itself going. So if you think of this joint as something that goes like this and it's surrounded by ligaments that keep it from going like this and just let it go that one way and muscles that move it, if things happen along the way that destroy the ligaments or tear the muscles and the joint becomes wobbly, the, the, the bone will automatically compensate for that and grow up in large prominences on the edges to stabilize itself. And what are those things called? Bone spurs. So we all think of bone spurs as being something bad, but they're not really something bad. They're part of the body's adaptive mechanism. 
And in certain situations, they're good, like this. If they stick into something, like your spinal cord, or the nerve to your arm, that's not so good. But ordinarily, they're there for a reason. And these joints, when they become irritated, because things are wearing out, one of the things they do is make spurs, and the irritation within them is sort of a reflex inflammation that occurs that makes the knee swell up, fill with fluid, and be inflamed. Now inflammation is a variable characteristic from one person to another just as the speed of healing is variable, just as the amount of bone spur you make is variable, and it's useful in some settings and it's bad in others. I see lots of people in my office standing registering or making an appointment and I look at them and their legs are bowed and I know they've got horribly worn out knees. And I walk up to them and I say, uh, you should see me. Why are you here? And they say, well, my shoulder hurts. I was playing tennis this morning and it hurts. And I say, how old are you? And he said, I'm 82. And I said, how long do you play tennis? Two hours every day. I said, you mind if I x-ray your knee? And we take an x-ray and it's not just bone on bone, but digging a hole into here like that so the knee goes and becomes crooked in a bow leg. So how does that person not have pain, I hear you say? And the answer is they don't have a lot of inflammation. They're lucky. So for some people, if you're a farmer and you, you know, stick a, a nail in your foot and you get bacteria in there, a brisk inflammatory response that fights that off and keeps you from getting an infection and dying in 1840, that would be good. But in 2000, having a knee that's got some wear and gets all swollen and irritated because that's the nature of your inflammatory response is less useful because it makes it stiff and sore. So what do you do? You rest and keep it in a bent position and all of a sudden you get a contracture and it won't straighten. Then when you go to stand up, your knees won't straighten, so your hips have to bend and your back has to do this. And all of a sudden, one thing leads to another. That's not so good. So this program for three groups of people, and I'm going to tell you what they are now. The first group is people who have moderate arthritis with the beginning of narrowing. They can't be fixed with telescopic surgery anymore and total knee is too much for them. That's the first group. The second group are people who could have a total knee. It's bad enough to say, have a total knee. They don't want to. Or they're not ready. They have a sick relative they're taking care of. They just don't want it. They're moving, they have a job. They know if they have that operation, they're head of the maintenance department, at Bob Sperry, who's been having treatments for me for two years, he knows if I replace his knee at 59, his job is over. Because he can't work, he can't do that kind of a job with total knee. So for various reasons, there are people who could have it but don't want to have it, that's group two. And it's my responsibility as their doctor not to let their knees get so bad that it ruins them physically. That they become overweight, out of shape, contracted, deformed, and it turns them into a poor candidate for knee replacement because they don't have a strong heart or something else is wrong with them. I, I must not let that happen. And then group three, finally, are those who are too sick, too old, have too many risk factors to have a knee replacement. Now, too old, I mean, I, I, treat, I take care of the Marinol sisters and they lead a pure life, as I'm sure you know. So many of them still work and are active into their late 80s and 90s. And in healthy people, that's not too old to replace a knee. But some people are too old or too sick. They have risk of infection. They're on dialysis. <clears throat> their hearts are so weak they can't take it or they have active cancer in their body that's out of control. These people, we can't replace their knee on. So that's the third group. They get the treatments too. So now let's go away from my explanation to you of what is arthritis. And uh, we're talking about this wear and tear arthritis. There are many other kinds. <clears throat> Let's talk for a minute about the surface of this joint, the pink. And I'm going to draw a little picture of it over here. We're going to 
going to just take this little area right here. I'm making a box. Does everybody see that box? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. And I'm going to draw it here. The white line is this. And the pink is going to be <coughs> all the way to here, that thick. So we've taken something that's normally three to four millimeters in thickness, and we've made it six inches here. Does everybody see what I'm doing? Mm -hmm. I want to show you the anatomy of this so that you understand, because we're all here tonight, I believe, because other than taking a bunch of things that we already have, drugs that suppress inflammation, shots that suppress inflammation, a new group of products have come on the market 10 years ago, which are mucus-like substances that we put into the knee that directly affect this. And over the years, I've used a variety of them. There's one in particular that worked well for us in my practice for a number of reasons, being a good and a safe product that works, but also being appropriately marketed and priced so that I can buy it at cost. The government pays me as I use it, and the patients don't have to go get it. And if I tell you it's expensive, it's like $150 a vial. And the federal government is happy to pay for it. For this one brand, they think it's reasonably priced. Many of the other ones they won't pay for. And that makes it very difficult for me to vend it to patients when I'm losing money. And most patients who have bad knees, they can't get it together to go and buy the stuff and come. It becomes a logistical nightmare. So sitting in here, upside down on the bone, I'm showing you the bottom of the thigh bone, are these things that look like bird cages. Just a bunch of, like this, like a bunch of protein strands that form a dome-shaped cage that's mounted on the bone. And inside that cage, like little birds trapped, are these giant molecules, the biggest molecules you could ever believe as molecules go, which are still microscopic, that look, if you looked at them under an electrical microscope, it looks like you're looking at a bottle brush. Everybody knows what a bottle brush is, right? With quills all over it that stand out stiff. And it's made out of a combination of sugar and protein. And it's the same kind of stuff that's in your ear, in the soft part of your nose, in the crop of a chicken, inside your eye, in the chamber of your eye. And it has an interesting property, which is it's intensely attractive to water. And these cages sit one next to the other, completely in this cartilage. And embedded in it are cells, living cells, that make that mucus. And those bottle brush molecules sit in that cage, and they suck in water from the joint that comes in through the surface. It makes this pearly white stuff swell up a little bit. And as you walk on it, some of the water squeezes out and gets in between the matching surface on the other side. And that articulation of those two substances, one on the other, is the slipperiest thing we know in the world. Slipperier than Teflon slipperier than Hans Brinker on the skates, <laughs> slipperier than anything we know. And if you look microscopically as the joint space starts to narrow, you see this whole thing starts to become fishuggled. It just come apart. And the cells are leaking out, and the bird cage strands are ripped and torn, and <clears throat> the molecules are in the joint. They don't belong in the joint. They belong in the bird cage. That's what creates the chemical stimulus of inflammation that we try to curtail. It's a mechanical process. Maybe you jumped off the truck, or you walked too much, or you ran too much, or you just did it every day. Whatever it was, as this starts to wear out, you get that inflammation in the knee. There's two basic parts. The first part is, I'm going to take away the pain by stopping the inflammation. That's the main cause of it. That's what gives you unrelenting pain, stiffness, soreness, when you sit, when you lie, when you move. <clears throat> Without that inflammation, you might have good and bad days or momentary twinges if you twisted and caught something the wrong way, but in between that, your knee would feel okay, and you could do what you had to do. 
How do we get rid of that inflammation? We throw everything at it we can, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. The second part of the program, after we get rid of the inflammation, is to help you to make yourself strong and flexible. So if I took one of you and I had you stand up on this table and jump down on the floor, and God knows I wouldn't do that, <laughs> and you landed stiff like a, a bowling pin, you would jar the shock right up through your body, through every joint, ankle to knee, to hip, to back. But if you landed and you went down into a gradual crouch, all the force would be absorbed by the muscles of your calf, your thigh, and your buttocks, and you'd cushion and protect that damaged knee. So after I get rid of the inflammation with a variety of products we're going to talk about, the most important thing is what you do for yourself. I send you to therapy. They teach you and help you for a grueling, like boot camp, eight weeks of strengthening and stretching yourself to be better suited to take care of your knee. If during that first eight weeks you need special help to keep the pain controlled, I have a way of helping you with that, with medicines. But at the end of three months, you're in a better place. And at that point, we then start you in a cycle. And the cycle is basically getting two shots in your knee every three months. Now, two shots in your knee every three months is different than the way any of you have ever had shots before. I've heard. Who's had shots? There's one because I sort of figured it out myself just from what I know they were doing in Japan and also because it's not approved by the FDA to be given that way. <laughs> but that doesn't mean it's no good. So what we do with all the people who come to me is we get rid of their inflammation First, by giving them a shot of something which is a relative of cortisone. But it's important that I not call it cortisone, because it's not cortisone. But why not? Because it's specially modified, so it can't get out of the place you put it. It does not go into the body. Cortisone is a hormone from the adrenal gland. <clears throat> the adrenal gland sits on top of your kidney. Without it, you would die almost immediately. It's got two parts. One part makes adrenaline, which is the reason you would die immediately. And the other part makes cortisone, which helps balance how much salt and water are in your body. But more than that, also controls inflammation. Because I've already told you, too much inflammation is no good. And cortisone slows down the inflammatory tendencies of the body. So we start by giving you a shot of something like cortisone, but it's not. What it is is steroid and all the hormones that come from the testes, the ovaries, and the adrenals are called steroid hormones because of their chemical shape. <clears throat> it's a steroid that's not dissolvable in water. So that's why it won't go through your body. So I call it water-insoluble steroid. We're going to call it that for the rest of this talk, because if I say cortisone, it's going to get you worried. I know that, because nobody likes cortisone. So you start, you get a water inside the steroid shot. You go away for a week. I tell you to take it easy and let it work. You come back in four to seven days, and you say to me, 98 times out of 100, I felt great. And if I said, great, goodbye, have a good life, a week later, it would all be back, and you'd say, what was that? But I don't do that. At that perfect time, I then give you the shot of the second stuff, which is the syrup that resembles the cartilage, the eye, the nose, the chicken's crop, which is where it comes from. There's somebody at the chicken plant. I won't go into the details, but it's extracted out of that body part, and a syrup is made. And that syrup has in it the same bottle brush type stuff that I talked to. Remember the bottle brush molecule? But it only has like one strand on the bottle brush. It's just got a piece of one of those in it. It doesn't have the whole thing. But that is such a big molecule 
that if you ate it, it would be destroyed in your stomach. The tiny little bits of it, so small that they're almost not worth mentioning, are what are glucosamine and chondroitin. But the stuff we inject in is a sizable piece, not giant, a sizable piece. And the hope used to be, if you put that in the joint, it's going to get put back into that worn cartilage in those bird cages, and the cartilage will grow back and all will be well. Does anybody think that really ever happened? No. But, as we used it, we found it did something, and like so many good ideas that were good for a different reason, they figured out, to some extent, that if you put it in a knee that's quieted by the water-insoluble steroid, everybody remember the water-insoluble steroid, if you put the syrup in next, the knee becomes even quieter, and in a healthy state, the knee starts to make another molecule, which is also sugar and protein, that's like a biologic spring, and that is a cushioning molecule. And the goal is to get your knees as healthy as we can get them as far as inflammation and cushioning. So you get that second shot, and right away, if it's the first time, you go to therapy and you start the exercising for eight weeks, three times a week. To strengthen your buttocks, your thighs, your calves, to help you stand up straighter, stretch certain key groups so that you can stand up straighter, and at the end of two months, if you're still alive, <laughs> you'll be better. But I might have to help you along the way, and if you call up and say, I'm having a tough time with that therapist, or the therapist, is my head therapist, calls me and says, she needs help, there are different additional pills to stop inflammation that you can be given in a carefully monitored, safe way with the help of your primary doctor or your heart doctor to make sure that it doesn't mess you up in any way, just for enough time to finish the eight weeks. At the end of three months, you come back to me and we start the two shots again, a week apart. So my way of doing this, and the name of that syrup, by the way, that I put in is called HA, sodium hyaluronate. There's a bunch of different companies that make it, and I'm gonna to talk to you about that in a minute, but just let me show you how I do it. This is time, and this line is one year, and this is six months, zero, three, nine, 12 months. And this line here, can everybody see that? This line up here is pain. And the higher up we are, the more pain you have. So people come to me and they're in pain up here, big pain. And right away, I give them the two shots. I give them the steroid shot, and a week later, I give them the HA shot, and their pain, right away, goes down. And it's gonna stay down, we know this from research, about eight weeks, 10 weeks. And then it's gonna to start to come up again. And they're gonna to get to me here. And they're gonna have had therapy in the middle. And maybe they'll also have had pills to help them. Does everyone understand this? At three months, the pain comes back. And then I'm gonna give them the same two shots again. And now, what's gonna happen, they're gonna be exercising on their own. And everybody knows when you exercise on your own, it's easier than when the therapist is there kicking you. <laughs> so it doesn't make you a sore, and plus they're already strong, so they don't have to get that strong the next time around. So now it's gonna go down, it's gonna stay down, it's only gonna come up a little. And then I'm gonna give them the shots again, right here. And it's going to go down again, and eventually it never gets very high because it's been quiet and they're stronger and they're in a better state of health in what I call a positive cycle because the inflammation is less, the muscle strength and flexibility is more, that protects and cushions the knee, which reduces the stimulus to become inflamed. So good leads to good. 
around and around and around. That's the opposite of the deteriorating spot cycle of negative feedback. This is how we do it. However, when these drugs were first invented and thought of, and of course, this country with a strict drug administration, you all know that things get tested and used in Europe and Asia way before they come here, because our government is very strict about allowing new products. That's a great benefit sometimes, like thalidomide, you all remember that. We didn't have that much here. But it's also sometimes not as good, with certain cancer treatments that are on the edge. But be that as it may, when they invented this drug in Europe, back then they thought, we're going to make this drug, it's going to rebuild the cartilage, we're going to bring people to ourselves who have a problem, we're going to give them five of these. They didn't put cortisone in first, just five shots, one a week for five weeks. And it worked on some people, didn't work on others, but in the end, right away the American company said we want it. But we know that Americans being the way they are, are not going to come for five shots. It's too much time. And plus it was already becoming clear that when you gave these shots, five of them, they only lasted about two months. And the American companies went to the government, and the government went to the American companies, and the company said, all right, we want to sell these shots three at a time. They're very expensive for us to make. And uh, people won't buy them. But if you pay for them, people won't have knee replacements. A knee replacement costs the federal government for a Medicare patient $32,000. You should just know my fee that the government pays me, and that's all I'm allowed, is $1,100. So most of it goes to the hospital and the equipment manufacturers, but that's the way it is. And the government said, fine, we'll pay for that. And they set a price at the time, about $130 a shot. Am I getting the hook here, Rika? No. no. I was going to get yanked. Yeah, okay. And um, the, um, the government paid. The companies made it. But then somebody said, let's do some scientific studies. And let's take this stuff and let's label it with radioactive elements in trace amounts that we can see on a Geiger counter. And so they made chicken mucus with radioactive nitrogen or carbon in it. And they injected it into people's knees. And every day they went and got a Geiger counter test. And they saw within four days, five days, it's all gone. So they knew it wasn't building up the knee. And yet it was doing something in certain cases. In some people it made the knee swell up gigantically. In some people it quieted the knee. But in all the studies, the best results lasted about two months. The worst results <coughs> had to do with two reasons. I'll just mention that as a side. Some people are allergic to chicken, but I can't remember seeing any. They say that. The real reason that the shots didn't work were two reasons. One, because the knee was inflamed, and you put the shot in, that giant bottle brush thing, putting that in a molecularly active knee where there's inflammation going on, white blood cells racing in there as though they think there's an infection, releasing all kinds of chemical weapons to fight infection. They destroy that bottle brush the way as a blimp would be destroyed if it landed on a battlefield with bullets racing around. They, they don't survive. They can't do what they need to do and inflame these, so they don't work. And worse than that, if by mistake you put that injection not into the cavity of the knee, but into the various complicated folded membranes around the knee, because the knee is like an accordion. It opens and it closes, and when it's closed, there's not a lot of air in that sac. And getting that needle in is not so easy. And if you put it into the side of the bellows, it causes tremendous inflammation, like a bomb went off. So going back, so they, uh, they were selling it three at a time. That's how they paid. The government said, we like paying for this. We don't want to pay for one at a time anyway, because it's too much bookkeeping for us. But if we sell them in kits of three, you can use them in kits of three. And so there I was, 2001, 
doing toe joints, knowing that not every patient should, could, or would have one. I told you all about that, right? Wanting to do something other than give them Motrin and glucosamine and chondroitin with these new shots. There were already papers in the literature that told me I could safely give water insoluble steroid, remember that, right? Like cortisone, but not <laughs> once every three months. And for the rest of someone's life, that was okay. That was proven. And I thought to myself, with a little help, because I knew that they were doing this in Japan, and that if I took these people, well, no, I started doing it the way they said. They would come to me on day one, I'd give them a cortisone shot, and after that, I'd give them three water, and I'd give them three sodium hyaluronate shots, HA, and then I'd send them to therapy, and if they needed anti-inflammatory pills, like Motrin to help them through, I give them that. And what I found was, so I'm gonna draw that now, instead of this way, I'm gonna erase, well, I'm gonna to try to draw over it. I've used up most of my colors, but I'm gonna draw three shots, and this pain did the same thing, and then it came back, and as it came up here at three months, I couldn't give them another one because the government said you gotta give three at once, and we're not paying for more than three every six months. So I just gave them the steroid, and I couldn't give them another HA, so what happened? The pain went away for a week, and then it came back. So it was at that point, after a couple of years of fiddling with that, seeing it didn't work, which is still the way most doctors in this country are giving it, so that for most patients it winds up being one or two cycles, and then everybody says forget it. I knew they were doing it in Japan the other way, and I started doing this. I could only do it with private pay patients, <clears throat> because no one would pay. But as I did it, and it worked, and I wrote sort of a little manifesto about it to the insurance companies one at a time, and they said, all right, let's see what happens, because in the end, instead of six of these HA vials at 150 each a year, I was only using four, and that interested the insurance companies more than the science of it. And <clears throat> so we did it, and it worked pretty well. And that basically is the program. There are a few more things I'll tell you about it. At the end of six months of treatment here, before I give this third set of shots, I give everybody the chance to quit, say, Maybe you'll do what, you know, well without it. I mean, people come and say to me, do I have to do this forever? Why? And I would say, well, you know, there's a man outside Central Park stamping his foot up and down on the pavement, hard and fast. And a policeman comes over and says, why are you doing that? And he says, because if I don't do that, the elephants are gonna come into Central Park. <laughs> so, we don't have to keep giving the shots once we start. So if someone comes to me, who doesn't have a lot of arthritis on the x-ray, and I give them the shots because they have some, and at the end of six months they say, I haven't had pain since then, <clears throat> I might say, okay, go, I'll see you in four months, let's see what you look like. And at the end of four months, if they're happy, I might say, well, okay, if you have pain, you know where I am. But my, many times, because I don't do this for people with minor arthritis, they know and I know that they need this, because towards the end, of the three months, the pain comes up, and sometimes enough that they don't like it, and for those people, I make pills available. Now, I'm just gonna to talk to you for a minute about the pills, so you understand. Anti-inflammatory substance of the body are steroid hormones from the adrenal gland called cortisol. Cortisol. So those are, a, a different class of anti-inflammatories was developed in the 1930s, <coughs> which aspirin was the pioneer, and then ibuprofen or Motrin. And they're called non-steroidal. They're not the steroid molecule. They're like aspirin, anti-inflammatory agents. And those are available. And they're pills. And um, <coughs> you, um, I, there's a little green folder back there. Yeah. I encourage any of you who wish to take one because it's got a lot of interesting things in it some of which I wrote, particularly a booklet, which I wrote about eight or nine years ago, 
And in that booklet, I talked a lot about these non-steroidal medicines. At that time, a new group had come out, which were particularly useful for people with sensitive stomachs, because it didn't affect the stomach. Why? Inflammation in the body, which we talked about before, is like a series of waterfalls, where each stream falls into another, and the effect is an ever-multiplying series of rivulets that have the effect of inducing inflammation. White blood cells come in, capillaries form, molecules are released that kill bacteria, fluid pours in from the membranes. <clears throat> Blocking the inflammatory cascades takes a few days of complete suppression. If you just stop it for a minute, this stream keeps running and this little pool pours into there, and it's not done. Three or four or five days of it already is a pretty good start. One of the side effects of doing that, which we don't like, is that your stomach stops making mucus. And the mucus of the stomach is rich in bicarbonate, and bicarbonate is what buffers or protects the stomach lining from the acid that the stomach makes to digest food. So when you take an anti-inflammatory agent for a long time, your stomach is vulnerable to being eroded by its own acid. This new group of drugs they made 10 years ago, Vioxx and Celebrex, didn't do that, but they had other effects that were bad. They interfered with the control of high blood pressure. Too many people were getting them because of direct marketing and patients saying, I want that. And now there's no more Vioxx because they had a lot of lawsuits for people who had blood pressure problems and diabetes taking it and getting high heart attacks. They shouldn't have it to begin with. The bottom line is these drugs can be given with deacidifiers of the stomach, with careful monitoring for people who have blood pressure to make sure that their legs don't swell or their blood pressure doesn't go up. And if they need it, they can at the end of the three months when the pain comes back say for the last two or three weeks, knock it down by taking the oral anti-inflammatory under the combined supervision of me and their primary doctor or cardiologist, whom I communicate with. And that keeps their knee quiet. And after a few cycles where the green line doesn't get up to nine and stays down here, and they get stronger and fitter, maybe thinner, the overall effect is that they feel better and they get into that positive cycle. So that basically covers it all, all other than to say, again, that the beauty of this program is that I was finally able to get Medicare to pay for giving it one at a time rather than three at a time. They recognize, at least in my case, that it's helping a lot of patients. We're using it. This particular company it's called MyTech, but it's, uh, it's owned by Johnson & Johnson. Makes a very lovely, safe mucus product that I can afford to buy because the government pays me. So you don't have to go get it and bring it to me from the pharmacy, which happens with some of the other ones because the government doesn't pay as much money as they charge. So this one is not terribly expensive, but it's safe and it's worked for me for the last six or seven years now. I've had lovely results with it. The complications of this are almost nothing with careful monitoring, and I'm a very careful person. I live to do knee replacements. I love doing knee replacements. That's my favorite thing. I did one two days ago. I'm doing one tomorrow. But it's not for everybody. And for one reason or another, people can't or won't have it. And we have this, which has worked in my hands beautifully. I uh, presented it last Friday at a regional meeting in Saratoga of uh, 75 orthopedic surgeons. And even though it's sort of antithetical to the tendency in my specialty to operate on everything, there were many doctors who were very curious and interested and wanted to know more because clearly there are many people in a gray zone with knee arthritis, not ready for knee replacement, 
And all these experimental operations of taking plugs of bone from here and putting them there and taking cartilage out of your rib and growing it and putting it back in, none of them work very well. I mean, the fact that when I was training in Toronto, that thing was invented in rabbits by one of the guys I worked with, and it's still not perfected 30 years later, ought to tell you that maybe that's not the answer yet. We may not have the answer to the gray zone, and, it, and maybe the ultimate answer will be to prevent arthritis in other ways, but right now, I can tell you that this is something that works. It's not a miracle. It's not a magic wand. It doesn't work for everything and everybody. But if you've been to someone who gave you shots the other way and it didn't work, don't assume that it won't work this way. This is different. And I've taught you tonight why. So I'm done with what I had to say. <coughs> I think I spoke for 55 minutes or so. But I'm happy to entertain questions on this subject. Yes, speak loud. Orthovisc, Synvisc, the word visc, that's a, a logo or a brand name for various sized pieces of sodium hyaluronate, which are single parts of a bristle. And it's really not just a bristle, it's like a snowflake. If you look at a snowflake under the microscope, each point reveals itself to be multiple points, and each multiple point itself is multiple points. And when you have a pattern that expands, the more you look at it, it's called a fractal. And synvisc is a tiny part. Orthovisc, the one that I'm using, the one that uh, I think is the most useful because it can be marketed to the people directly through my office in a program where you don't have to go buy it. Orthovisc is the one I use. You should get away from the names. Trust your doctor to pick the right one. They're hyaluronic acid. That's the answer. Cortisone is destructive to the knee. Uh, is, are these shots destructive at all? Is cortisone destructive to the knee? I said this isn't cortisone. It's cortisol. <coughs> um, is it destructive to the knee? The effect of cortisone is to inhibit the white blood cells from coming into the knee and secreting the molecules that destroy bacteria. That's the main thing it does. It does it locally, and if you take it systemically, it stops your whole body from making white blood cells. But this just stays in the knee. Uh, I told you that there was a study done um, in which 150,000 water insoluble steroid shots, that's not cortisone, were studied and in a controlled way, multiple universities, and they determined that it was safe to have that every three months and never damage your knee. Giving it more isn't useful and might not be safe. It certainly isn't good to give it in a tendon because it weakens collagen. So if you have Achilles tendonitis, you shouldn't shoot collagen into that. But it's given in the shoulder, it's given in the ankle, it's not cortisone, it doesn't go anywhere else, it's like cortisone, and it doesn't, if it's used in this fashion, have side effects. It doesn't make your blood sugar go up, it doesn't <coughs> make your hair change, it doesn't make your shoulders get fat, uh, or your face puff up, because it doesn't get into your system. Furthermore, taking one shot every three months is nothing. So the answer is it's safe. Questions? Does it come on suddenly? Like I woke up one morning and both knees were, you know, painful. Depends what you did the week before. If you went to uh, Manhattan and climbed up uh, the Statue of Liberty with your nephew or grandson or whatever, the next day it might come on suddenly. Um, ordinarily it comes and goes and comes, sometimes things aggravate it. Everything has a beginning. Things that come on suddenly can be the start of osteoarthritis if you tear your meniscus. Um, in a 20-year-old who twists their knee a certain way and tears that fibrocartilage, if we put a telescope in and very delicately take out the torn part or sew it back, that's helpful. Why? Because if I took a laboratory model animal and I made a tear in their cartilage and let them then live their life when they were 20 years old, 
By the time they were 30 and 40 and 50, the knee is going to start to get wear and deterioration because that torn cartilage doesn't do what it's supposed to do, like a chipped tooth in a multi-gear transmission. But on the other hand, if I go in in that 20-year-old and I trim that piece out, I'm sorry, I leave the torn piece, that knee is going to go bad faster than a knee that I've removed the cartilage from. If that knee might go bad in 10 years, and a knee that I surgically take the cartilage might go bad in 30. So we gain that patient 30 years over 10 years by trimming their cartilage for a 20-year-old. For a 40-year-old, it's different. For a 50-year-old, it's different. Why? Because their knees are starting to wear everywhere. Their cartilage softens a little bit. By the time they're 60, and you put the telescope in, it's not just a torn meniscus. You can see that the surfaces are dented and soft and have tears and fissures in them. Then if you take the cartilage out, the torn meniscus rather, now you throw the worn surfaces against each other without their old friend, the damaged meniscus, and they wear out very quickly. You often get people who come to me for shots who've had a recent arthroscopy that made them worse. And sad to say, some of them wind up needing their knee replaced because by then it's too late. Arthroscopy in people over 55 should be suspect in almost all cases. It rarely works. You had a question. Yes, is there any benefit? I'll come back to you. I'm going to circle. Is there any benefit to hyaluronic uh, acid pills for people who have arthritis? Because it's been shown to prevent arthritis. No, the answer is what about pills? And I already said the glucosamine chondroitin is a tiny molecule. Even that, it's a, it's a double sugar, even that tiny thing may not get into your knee. It may be degraded in your bloodstream. It may have some natural anti-inflammatory effect, like aspirin, but it does not do much in the joint. If you gave the real, if you took this orthobisc and you swallowed it, it would all digest in your stomach, like eating a piece of gristle. It, it's too big to get into your bloodstream. What was your second question? in the joint and then an inflammation in the nerves behind? Yeah, no, the inflammation is in the membrane of the joint. Okay. The membrane has nerves running through it to innervate it. If your knee swells with inflammation, the nerves in the membrane of the knee stretch. That's why when the weather changes, people who have an inflamed knee know because the barometric pressure changes outside and there's either a cavitation or an engorgement of the capsule of their knee because the pressure is changing. So your knee is like a barometer with your brain being the sensor and the impulse that you feel is pain. So the nerve, the joint capsule is innervated. Any other questions? Yes. Doc, if you're almost bone on bone, yeah. is that program effective? Okay, if you're almost bone on bone, does this help? The answer is yes, but it depends on how much bone on bone. In the old days, we used to take x-rays at special surgery with people squatting like this. And that would show bone-on-bone -bone contact that you wouldn't see when someone was standing up straight. And I thought, what a clever boy I am. I take this fancy x-ray up in Tarrytown, and I say, aha, you've got bone-on-bone, -bone, let's operate. Because <laughs> if I talk, took people to the operating room who didn't have bone-on-bone, -bone, my senior partner would raise one eyebrow like, what are you doing there, young man? It's too soon to operate. So we found people with early bone on bone. And what I found was that number one, early bone on bone, I could treat this way. The people were happier. Sometimes they didn't want the surgery, so I did it. But gradually I learned all early bone on bone should have this treatment. Almost bone on bone isn't bone on bone. So it depends on how much, how thin, and how much is involved from the front to back of one side of the knee. So the answer is, it's worth having an x-ray or two and seeing if it'll work. And then you'll know. There's no harm in this, there's very little downside. If you have very mild arthritis here at the beginning uh, and you want to prevent it getting to the point where you need any uh, How can you prevent early arthritis worsening, assuming you're not prone to inflammation that needs to be chemically suppressed. You can get in your own positive cycle, keep your weight down, avoid excessive impact, do not exercise repetitively, the same exercise day after day. If you're going to be walking, one day don't walk the second day, 
Uh, if you're going to walk, don't walk for two hours. Try to walk for 45 minutes on, at times rapidly, at other times slowly. You do interval training so you get your strength and conditioning without the number of steps. The more steps, the more impact, the faster the wear. Keep your weight down, vary your exercises. Yes. Yes. The product the most enjoyed. Yes, we talked about that, right. Some of, it, some of it has MSM. Okay, what is MSM? MSM is methyl sulfonyl methane. And, uh, it's a, and uh, before that, uh, an even better one was DMSO. Remember that one? If you take a racehorse before a big race and it's just starting to limp and you want it to run, you take this DMSO out of the can, it smells like paint dinner. And when I was in chemistry, we actually used it as a solvent to dissolve difficult things. And you put it on the rag and rub it on their knee, and the pain goes away. And if you're a human and you do that, you taste garlic on your tongue the minute it goes on your knee, and it goes through your whole system. Your liver doesn't like it. And MSM, methyl sulfonyl methane, is, is the anhydrous derivative being the water molecules chemically removed from DSMO, DSM, uh, DSMO. So methyl sulfonyl methane has a similar effect, but it's really not known because it's not a drug and it's not studied by the FDA what its effects are on the human body. But I think that it should be approached with caution by virtue of the analysis of what it is and where it comes from and what its parent compound was shown to do, which was damaging to the liver. I, I think that if you need an anti-inflammatory, you should take one that's understood and can be dosed precisely. Glucosamine chondroitin, although I used to give it by the truckload, the, the really good data on it is that its effect is not direct on the joint. It has a generalized anti-inflammatory effect, which is variable based on its the degree of variability in how it's digested and absorbed, which is why sometimes it's broken down in the stomach, other times it gets into the bloodstream. And if you want to take an anti-inflammatory, take Motrin. That's quantitative in milligrams, and it's pretty much standard for all humans. Yes. Dr. C. Barker, can you just capsulize this, how this, how this procedure works and, and in the stages it does? So the essence of the procedure, again, is to suppress inflammation with two shots given a week apart, back to back, and repeated every three months in sequence so that you, the patient, can maintain strength and flexibility of the surrounding and supporting muscles and joints so that you, in effect, can cushion your knee and lead to a positive cycle of healing. Any other questions? Yes. Would a person on a suppressive antibiotic treatment be ineligible? No, not necessarily. Uh, certain anti-inflammatory agents don't go well with certain antidepressants. People who are on aspirin for their heart Sometimes when we use the anti-inflammatory for a few weeks, we stop the aspirin for those same few weeks because it does the same thing. No, antibiotics are not a reason. There are very few contraindications to this. Yes? Uh, I'm not on Medicare because uh, my insurance is ended. Do they pay for Yes, they do. They like this. They, the insurance companies in Westchester have bought into what I'm doing because it saves people having surgery and they see my program working. Do you take, uh, also take insurance then? Uh, uh, we work with all insurances, but I participate in none. You need to speak to my office and they'll, they'll right. talk to you about that. Okay. Would you recommend uh, exercising with a stationary bike as opposed to walking so that's less Yes, I mean, again, I said when you exercise, it should be varied, it shouldn't be the same each day. The question was stationary bike, low resistance, interval training. So if you're going to do a 20 minute walk or a 20 minute bike, you want to start with a two or three minute warm up till you're flush and lightly sweating. And then you want to do sets where you either increase the speed of walking or walk on a hill and then rest by walking on a level. 
for a minute, three minutes of hill, three minutes of level, three minutes of hill, three minutes of level, three minutes of hill, three minutes of level, three or four of those, and then a four minute form down. On the, on the bicycle, you can do that by increasing the resistance and or increasing the speed you pedal. And as a general rule for bad knees on a bicycle, you don't want the seat too high. You don't want your knee to completely unfold on the bottom of the cycle. Questions? Yes. Oh, uh, could you comment on the correct position for a driver? Uh, is is repeated sit, sitting in the wrong position in the driver's seat of a car yeah. or a van? Can you can you? What happens? Idea? Why it hurts when you drive or sit at the movies uh, or sit for a long time is that the damaged hyaluron uh, the di damaged hyaluronic cartilage the, with the bird cage is partially destroyed presses down, gives up its water, flattens out to nothing, and you've got a bare spot. The nerves are not in the cartilage, they're in the bone underneath, and when you first get up or you're driving and the water is pressed down your cartilage, it really starts to ache. There is no real cure for that other than varying the seat as you drive every 15 minutes, shifting it in, shifting it out, twisting your leg, fooling with it, that's a tough problem, but having the inflammation in your knee Reduced and getting on these treatments helps somewhat, but that's not a guarantee. Other questions? And, uh, do you give these injections simultaneously in both knees? Yes, absolutely. Everyone hates injections. For in a thin, relaxed person without giant bone spurs, I can do a shot in one second. In people who are big or twisted or deformed or have varicose veins or um, various problems that make the shots harder, I have an ultrasonic delivery system where I can measure the angle that's going to get the needle in there in one second without touching bone so that I can give the shots just as painlessly for difficult knees as for easy knees. Other questions? Yes? For pain relief, what are your thoughts on laser therapy? You mean putting a laser in the knee or are you talking about on the skin? Physical therapy. Yeah, I mean I think that laser on the skin is a useful modality. And uh, so is, I didn't mention it, putting hot pepper cream on your knee. Uh, the, there's a limited amount of nerves that come up to the brain, and uh, some of them are in the skin, and some of them are in the knee. They both go up through the same cable, and there's only so many that can fire at once, and there's a gate, so to speak, simplistically, where the stimuli enter the brain, and if you flood the brain with stimuli, you block some of the pain stimuli by having the sunburned skin stimuli or the pepper on the skin stimuli or when you were a kid you ran on the playground and you fell and you hit your knee and you reflexively take your hands and rub it on your knee, that's what that does. Yeah. Okay. Are there any side effects to that? Are there any side effects to that? This is an expert here, Joanne Gelsey. There's a few devices you can use safely with children, with pacemakers, et cetera, so they really aren't Right. They have to be done with a licensed person, with a frequently checked, carefully monitored machine, so that you don't have a side effect. We can give Dr. Seabock a round of applause. Thank you very much. Oh, I, I thought he was a very good pre presenter. He's very knowledgeable. Um, I thought it was very helpful, and he was able to present it in a way where uh, people who are not medical people could understand it. It was a very interesting concept as to how to take care of your knees. I, I thought it was a very good presentation and gave us a lot of information and useful information about the bones and the legs and things of that nature. So it was very useful. Uh, he he couldn't have he couldn't have been more um, helpful. He was extraordinary. He was uh, he spoke on a level where we could all understand the lecture, and uh, and I'm anxious to uh, call his office for an appointment. Very informative. I'm not thinking about you know operation or knee replacement. It's not hasn't gotten that far yet. I, I thought it was very informative and I did get a lot of information that I didn't know about before. Yeah, I would uh, think this is a much better process than having surgery and it's more natural and the doctor seems very, very competent, very, very knowledgeable and he answered all questions wonderfully and uh, I would have great confidence in him actually as my doctor.
Well, I, I've had the, the three sequence of shots before, and they did work for me. And I'm thinking of having them done again. And this is a new approach uh, that I hadn't heard of before. So I probably will investigate it. Uh, anything to avoid the knee operation, uh, which is number one.